Okay, hello and hola to everyone. Welcome to our 48th session. My name is Sang Ni, and I am in one of the organizers of the Porous Media Tea Time Talk and Interpol Young Academy. And today I have joined here with me the rest of the team members. We have Ramin, uh, who are a recent addition to our team, and I believe this is his first appearance in our streaming, so welcome. And we have Muhammad and Madi. Uh, today's session is a special session where we invited two great speakers from Brazilian Synchrotron Light Laboratory who will talk about uh, how we can use Synchrotron series uh, to post media research. So I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Daphne Pino. Uh, she is a geologist specialized in hydrogeology focusing on fractured aquifers and groundwater contamination at regional and local scales. A couple of years ago, she also started studying porous aquifers at micro scale, which led her to current work at Brazilian Synchrotron Light Laboratory. Please welcome Daphne and the floor is yours. Thank you. Let me share my screen. Okay, so hopefully now you can see my window. Yeah? Yep, okay. we do. So thank you everyone for being here today. Uh, I'm Daphne and I'll be speaking to you about cleaning up contaminated soils and aquifers. And we're focusing on investigating pore scale processes with synchrotron X-ray microtomography. Um, so this here, this image that you see here on the right, this is the Sirius, Sirius Laboratory, which is our synchrotron light source here in Brazil. So why am I talking about groundwater? Um, well, one of the sustainable development goals from the UN is access to clean water and sanitation. So I think this explains all, like we all understand the importance of water for, for, for life. So when you're talking about Brazil, we're talking about over 200 million people. And this is a country that had the latest GDP in 2019. So it shouldn't be, we're, it, we shouldn't mean such a bad situation. That's what you would think. But however, 35 million people in the country do not have access to treated water. And when we look at all municipalities in the country, 52% of them depend on groundwater for water supply and that's either entirely they are entirely dependent on groundwater or partially dependent which means they use both groundwater and surface water so this is clearly a very important resource so just to give you an example here you see the state of sao paulo which is where i live i live and here we have the metropolitan city of the of sao paulo which is one of the most industrialized areas in the country so here on this map on the right, you can hopefully you can see these darker orange areas and this red one. They are all areas in the city where you have in industries concentrated. And all these black dots that you see here in this map, you see a lot of them are on the top of these industrial areas. Those black dots, they represent deep, deep supply wells. So those, is, those are wells that are extra extracting groundwater for different types of consumption. And why this is a problem? Because when you're doing this uh, in an industrial area, you have a great chance of, as you're exploiting groundwater, uh, you're lowering, lowering the water level that you have in, a, in your aquifer, and you're probably bringing anything, any uh, contaminant spills, any plumes of contamination that you have on the surface, you're also bringing them downwards with your water level and you're contaminating other levels of your soil and you're probably spreading this contamination uh, through your aquifer. So this is a very um, big problem in many industrial areas, in many urban areas, not only in Brazil, but throughout the globe. And we did some studies here in this red area that you can see here. So this is a typical uh, study that we do as a geologist that you see at the regional or local scale. So we usually go with a driller. We have um, our workstations here in the field. We, this is a very different scale from the micro scale. So you see me here, very happy with 
uh, along rock core, we usually work with soil and rock samples. We have stations for preparing those samples. We had we were studying here uh, our vertical profile with different soil types and rock types. We did we studied outcrops. We did geophysical profiling in as well. Uh, so all of this, this is a very different scale that usually geologists are used to that because we're usually looking at this local scale or uh, an even larger, uh, even regional scale. But what is controlling everything that we were studying here is actually what is happening at a micro scale, which is what is happening at a fracture or at a pore scale. And to study that, we cannot just uh, gather data directly from field work but we can use synchrotron light. So what is synchrotron light? Uh, it is a type of radiation that has a high brilliance and high energy, and it has a broad spectrum because you can have synchrotron light from infrared to X-rays. You see that the visible light is here in the middle. Um, so the type of synchrotron light that you're going to use, uh, the wavelength that you're going to use, it will depend on the kind of experiment that you want to perform. The ones I'm going to, the two examples that I'll show you today, they both use X-rays. Uh, and this is also the beam line that we work at Sirius. It, it's working with, um, with X-ray microtomography. So this is another photo of our lab. So as I'm speaking, as I'm talking about groundwater, something uh, we want to do, as we have seen clearly that Contamination is a huge problem. So one of the things that we want to do is clean up. That's the title of the presentation. So this is what we call a remediation process. So here um, is an example of a reaction of a solvent. This is a very used industrial solvent. It can be used for clean metal parts. Um, so it's used in, in many types of industries. And it's also uh, one of its father products. It's also used for dry cleaning, for example. So you have so it's a very common contamination in urban sites. So what we have been, what has been shown over the past decade or over the past 20 years is that this type of solvents, they react very well with nanoparticles of zero violent iron. Uh, and that's the reaction that you see here. So here you can see some images in the microscope of those nanoparticles and they are usually presented as powder. And what we want to see is how exactly these reactions are happening in a micro scale. So this is an example of a paper that our group published. Um, what you see here in red is the solvent, the TCE, and then we injected nanoparticles. And after the injection of nanoparticles, what we saw, uh, this yellow part here is actually gas that was produced during the reaction. And we saw the consumption of TCE, but we also saw that this gas that was produced, it was also dislocating some of the uh, solvent droplets. So this was very interesting, and this could only be done use, using synchrotron light, um, not only because we had to see things at a very small scale, but also because we would be able to see, to image the process at different times. So um, in a synchrotron beam line, you can also have images at different times, so it can almost have something. Um, you have resolution in time as well. It's almost you can almost make a movie of what is happening in your sample when you have an injection experiment. So, what basically happens in the main line? We have the X-ray source, so we're going to. Um, sorry, so we are going to. Uh, I forgot the word in English. Sorry for that. Um, this radiation will go through our sample here. Our sample, it will have to rotate so we can actually get different size of our sample. So later we can reconstruct a 3D image. And based on the composition of the sample, we'll have different absorption coefficients. So the sample will absorb or let the radiation pass through it in different ways, depending on its composition. And the radiation that comes to the, through the sample uh, will be collected by a detector, and this detector will provide information for us to later um, analyze the, those those three D images and separate phases and understand what is going on with our sample. So what we did, the first experiment that I want to show you, 
is based on the nanoparticles injection. So here, this is our flow cell. So we were injecting things from the bottom and going through here. This would go in front of the X-rays. So we would, X-rays would go through the sample when we would, let me show you on the side here, would go through the sample when we would collect the data uh, on the detector later. So we had a sample with uh, beads, with glass beads, and then we filled it with water. So we would have a first image of that with our sample, with our grain, with our porous media, with water. Then we put the sample to two rounds of nanoparticle injection, and each round of nanoparticle injection was followed by a final water injection. So we had uh, a sample saturated with water, injected nanoparticle, water again, then nanoparticle again, and finally water in the end. And what we wanted to see uh, where did, uh, how, what was controlling those nanoparticles at a poor scale. And something interesting about this, uh, about this experiment is that we were imaging this sample. It's about one centimeter long. We were imaged in, in three sections. So we had better resolution for a long sample. So if, if you never saw one of these images, this is about what you got. It looks a lot like a radiography. <laughs> this is a tomography image. So we see water here in the darker gray and our grains in the in light gray. This was after the first water injection. So that's all we have. Uh, this example is after the second nanoparticle injection. So you see here there's water, nanoparticle, water, nanoparticle, and water again, our five injection phases. So we have again the grains, we can still see the water, but now we see the nanoparticles here and a brighter gray. And we also see that some gas bubbles were formed here. Um, so this is the kind of image that we get from our detector. And what we do, we're going to segment, we're going to separate those phases. So we can calculate volumes, you can calculate surface contents, so basically anything you can think of. And we can also perform um, permeability experiments once we have the data regarding porosity on each one of them. And what is very interesting here is that we see after the final water injection, we can see that some places that before they had nanoparticles, they now were filled with water. So we, we could actually see that the water we were injecting was dislocated some of those nanoparticles. Um, and as we expect, those nanoparticles, they are usually retained in smaller pores like the portals after the final water injection. But what I want to, really want to show you on this experiment um, is this graph over here. This We have the, poro the pore space, like percentage of area of pore space, so our porosity here, and uh, this slice, so the bottom of our sample and the top. So after our first water injection, we had between 40, this is the light blue that you see here, uh, this one, uh, we had between 35 and 40 percent of porosity. After we injected nanoparticles, uh, we we go to this red line here, this sorry, this yellow line. So we yeah, we lowered our porosity between 15 and 20 percent through our sample. So this is kind of what we are, were expecting, and we we're happy because the nanoparticles were actually filling the pores, which is that's what you want to do for injecting the field to react with a contaminant. Then we injected water again to wash away those nanoparticles and we succeeded because this is what you see here in this medium blue here. We basically recovered our, all our porosity. So we're able to wash most of those nanoparticles away. Then we said, what happens if we inject nanoparticles again? What, what, what we will look like? Then we got this orange curve here and we see we actually reduce even further our porosity. So what we think that was happening here, either we were able to inject more nanoparticles or what we believe that was happening, um, especially because after we injected water again, we actually get this dark blue here. So we see we did not fully recover our porosity after the second nanoparticle injection. Uh, and that's what we believe that happens here is that nanoparticle history is very important. So while it looked like at the first time we actually were able to wash all nanoparticles away, that's not true because some of the number of nanoparticles were actually retained in our media. And those nanoparticles that were still there, they were reacting with the new ones and that was causing more clog in our system. 
And this kind of thing is very important because when you're doing this in the field, uh, you cannot see this and you might be clogging your, your media, your soil, and your, the neon nanoparticles that you're injecting, they might not reach the place that you need to remediate. So this is very important uh, to consider when you're going for a field uh, scale ex injection experiment. The other experiment that I want to show you very fast <laughs> is for an in situ chemical oxidation experiment. So here uh, we also we have again uh, the grains and the water. And here we inject, we actually injected the TCE here, we injected the contaminant. And lastly, sorry for this, these two, they are filtered, but this one is not yet. But after that, we injected um, uh, permanganate. So we injected an oxidant uh, reagent. So it, so we can see that there is a lot less uh, solvents here. Uh, this is still an ongoing experiment because we have students working on this. Uh, and we're still working on what's happening here. But one of the interesting things here is that we saw very, very important variations of pressure in our system. So we are investigating these reactions, what is causing uh, this variation of pressures, because this, uh, this could be very significant depending on what you're doing also during field work. And we can do the same kind of analysis of distribution of porosity and permeability here. So what I want, what I hope you remember from this presentation is that with synchronous light, you have a very powerful microscope because you can see things at a micro scale and sometimes depending on your experiment, even at a nano scale. Uh, microtomography is the non-destructive method. So you can have, um, you can study your samples, you can down, you can take smaller portions with higher uh, detail without destructing your samples, and you can do studies at a pore scale. And we've been doing these studies of dynamics of fluids in porous media, because as I said before, the micro scale is a reflection of what is happening in the micro scale. And that's why this is important for fieldwork studies, for um, fieldwork uh, remediation processes. So. Uh, we had the example of transport and delivery of nanoparticles in porous media and a quick pass through the chemical oxidation processes at the pore scale. And all of this is because those things, they bring insights for flow models in remediation studies because we often have a whole remediation project and it, it happens that sometimes it doesn't work exactly like we were hoping for. So it's very important to understand uh, this particle mobilities and entrapment mechanisms. So if you want to know more about CIS, I invite you to visit the web page here. Uh, you can find more information on the lab. And there is also a call for proposals. I think it's coming up in September. So there should be information there soon. So if you have a research that you think it, you could develop it with, in one of the beam lines, you could also apply for that. And if you have questions with that, we can help you later. Um, I want to thank you all for being here, for hearing this talk, and for our partners in the Nanoparticle Project. And thank you again. If you have any questions, I would be very happy to, to answer. Okay, okay, now uh, we have to hand it to Ramin to ask any question if he has, and also take care of the questions from the YouTube. So Ramin, go, go ahead. Yes, thank you, Daphne, for the very nice talk. Very interesting. Uh, I actually have a question before going to the comments. Uh, so I was wondering, I'm just curious to know that if you have any plans to basically study other type of contaminants like PFAS, microplastics, pesticides, and those things also in groundwater because I assume that those also exist. Yeah. Um, those are very important contaminants, especially PFAS, they're like the hot topic right now in groundwater. Uh, we choose first the, the those chlorinated solvents like TCE or PCE because we were actually interested in understanding the interaction of nanoparticles in the porous media with those solvents. Um, but we don't have projects 
like right now for this, but I myself, I would be very interested in working with microplastics and PFAS. Um, as a hydrogeologist, I would be very happy to work with that. So if anyone wants help with projects, just let me know. <laughs> I'd be very happy to work with that. Yes. I actually have two questions, <clears throat> if I may. Yes. Um, <laughs> I personally work in remediation research, so I'm very okay. interested in uh, your research <clears throat> and talk. So my first question is, what happens to these nanoparticles after they react with TCE? Do they become dissolved or and uh, we don't have to worry about uh, their aftermath? Or what happens to them? Uh, when you're in the field, you know, <clears throat> right? yes. um, they, were, they are zero violent irons. So what you're going to, uh, what happens is that you have, um, you have iron ions in your groundwater later that we might have to precipitate. So that's the usual balance that you have to do. Do you prefer to enrich your aquifer in iron or do you leave your solvent there? Well, that's, um, I've, so that's usually what's going to happen. So if, can I share again? Um, let me see, share the screen. If we go back. the reaction here so this is what we'll have uh, we had the TCE and you have the uh, zero valent iron here so you're going to, you will be left with 18 that's like a lot less harmful than TCE or any of its daughter project products and uh, but you also be left with some iron ions mm -hmm. so yeah there is all it, it's not a perfect Thing in my opinion, because you're still enriching your aquifer with iron, but that's still way better than having TCE yeah. on your on your aquifer because if it degrades to DCE or to vinyl chloride, vinyl chloride it's even more toxic than TCE because mm -hmm. it, it can cause cancer, it's you have trouble with vapor intrusion, you have a lot more issues. It's a lot harder of filtering, of taking that out of your groundwater than the iron if you want to later use mm. your your groundwater. Okay. So I think it's a balance of what is the <laughs> what is the worst <laughs> that you can have in your groundwater. But I understand the worry. I usually have this this kind of concerns as well. Mm. Thank you. I have quick uh, second question <laughs> that if you inject this kind of uh, nanoparticles into porous media or fractured aquifer systems uh, mm -hmm. I think you will have preferential flow paths and there will be some uh, contaminants that are trapped in non uh, less per less permeable uh, areas so how do you plan to target the contaminants that are uh, sort of trapped in those uh, regions Okay, um, we have been doing mostly work, uh, we haven't gone to field scale yet, but there are works, I think, especially in Czech Republic, you can find some uh, works that they have been applying in field scale. So there are things that you have to consider before injecting them. For instance, if you have too much clay in your in your media, because you can have a sensor with different degrees of clay in it, of cementation, that could damage your injection because you won't be able to inject much of those nanoparticles in there. Um, with frac so you have actually you have to consider if your if your aquifer, if the composition of your aquifer is able to receive that kind of injection because it might not be the best uh, suitable um, option for for your case. So it's not just because they react very nicely with your contaminant that this is the best that you can use because they that's exactly what we're doing why we're trying to understand how they move in porous media and we're starting with a very simple system actually because we're just working with sand grains they are not consolidated so it's still a bit different from what we see like in the in the actual aquifer we, we try to we do our best to mimic but it's not the same as having uh sandstone with clay and many other minerals so um, you have actually studies, calling studies that you can also try that. Um, you definitely have to, cons uh, to consider 
maybe you, you would need different um, injection wells at different depths that could also help you would have it would be very case specific depending on what you have on your site and regarding um the fracture media that's that's never you never have uh an homogeneous flow in fractured media because you're always going to have <laughs> preferential flow paths so for that you, you really need to understand uh your fracture network before injecting anything because you can but that's even uh, even an even harder response. I don't think I've seen studies of nanoparticles in fractured rocks yet. Most of the ones I saw, I'm not saying they, they don't exist, but most of the studies out there, they are in porous media. But there, there are also some um, some softwares that you can like one developed by the people of the Polytechnic of Turin that they uh, you can simulate. The injection of nanoparticles in the porous media and they are going to give you information on this micro scale because they bring their they you can also input data from column tests so it's a very nice software this is, could be very useful from it's very useful for building this bridge between the lab work and the field work so there are different tools that you can try to do the best thing that you can for for your field work thank you Yes, I don't see any questions in the comments. If anyone else has a comment or a question, Mohammed, D, or no, then I would ask Sang to introduce the next speaker. And we thank you again, Daphne, for the very nice talk. Thank you. So I think, Mohammed, can you go ahead and uh, introduce our next speaker? Oh, actually, it was, oh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll do it. Um, just give me one second. So our next speaker is Dr. Aluizio uh, Salvador. Uh, he is a physicist graduated from the Federal University of uh, Paraná, Brazil. Currently, he is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Sao Paulo, uh, acting at a Brazilian synchrotron uh, laboratory in the city of Campinas, Sao Paulo, as a collaborating researcher, working on ways to visualize and understand the process involved in the capture and storage of carbon dioxide by rocks. Aluizio, the um, floor is yours. Okay. Thank you, Sam, for the introduction. Mm -hmm. Thank you all the team for the invitation to be here. It's a pleasure to be here. And I just want to add that I have a, a FAPEP scholarship. Uh, you can see my mouse, please. You can see my mouse in moving or not? Uh, yes, we can. OK, so I just want to add that I may have a scholarship from FAPESP in collaboration with the Research Center for Greenhouse Gas and Innovation. And today, I want to talk a little bit about the efforts and also the challenges we are facing <coughs> in the development of a microfluid device using a real rock as the sample uh, where we want to choose see the process involved in the mineralization process, the mineralization of carbon dioxide by using synchrotron techniques. Uh, specifically, we're going to analyze rocks from the Paraná Basin, which is located mainly in the south of Brazil, but it also expands to other countries. Uh, in this map, we also have it in the yellow dots, the ethanol and sugar plants that are believed to be the main source of carbon dioxide emis emission. So this good source sink matching would be easy to transport the carbon dioxide from the source to the sink. And it has encouraging a lot of uh, characterization, reservoir characterization uh, about these rocks. Uh, these previous works have shown uh, some Previous good results as well, and there the reservoir represents a good porosity and permeability that would allow the injection and the storage. Uh, there is a sweep top depth for geological storage uh, in this basin, and mainly it's formed by basaltic rocks, uh, which would be ideal for the mineral traffic. However, uh, there are yet many. Uh, 
studs to be performed. Uh, this this base is very heterogeneous. It's very big, so we need to map it. We need to sample uh, very par many parts of uh, this base. Uh, there are false breaks in the seal layers. Uh, it would be a problem for the injects because it could cause leaks uh, of carbon dioxide. And aside uh, these very interesting properties, there are only few studs that are yet on the literature, so we need yet a big effort on characterize these, these rocks. Given this information, uh, the goal of my postdoc project is to uh, to make a high-end characterization of these rocks and mainly evaluate the potential of this basin to, uh, to capture and to uh, store carbon dioxide. We are planning to do it uh, by using all the research of the Brazilian Synchrotron Light Laboratory, Sirius. Uh, Daphne, I will talk a little bit about, but I will make also a brief introduction about the Sirius and the potential. Focus on two beam lines that we are going to use, the Carnauba and the Mog. Also, I will talk about our rock on a ship device that we are de developing, and then I will let my final comments. Uh, this in, in the picture is the Brazilian Secret Light Laboratory called Sirius. Uh, here we have the parking place where it's possible to have an idea of the size of the Sirius compared to the cars. Uh, in a secret light, electrons are inside a ring. In, here in the Sirius, the ring has 500 meters of cir circumference. And strong magnets are responsible for keeping the electrons inside the rings while it rotates. But when the magnets bend the ring, the electrons to be kept inside the ring, uh, it generates the, the synchrotron light. The synchrotron lights account for a, for a wide range of the electromagnetic spectrum, and it can be selected and directed toward the beam lines along the ring. Uh, the advantages of using a synchrotron light is the high flux. We can make images of small parts of the of some structure and with higher resolution. This is the largest beam line of the series. It's called the Carnauba that I'm going to introduce in now. It has approximately 145 meters between the source where the Secretary light comes from the ring until the experimental station where the sample is analyzed. Along uh, this path, they are uh, set up with myros and slits and monochromators with the goal to demagnificate uh, the secret light so it can reach the sample with a nanometric beam spot. That's why this beam line is called a nanoprobe. It has a, that's why this uh, beam line has another problem. Uh, this beam, in this beam line, we can study many types uh, of non structure materials uh, by using two or three dimensional images with X ray absorption, emission, diffraction, or optical emission contrasts. Uh, however, to make our experiments, our mineralization experiments available in this beam line, uh, we need a big effort on the sample preparation. And here is where the, micro, the microfluidic devices take place. Just for a contextualization, microfluidic devices are uh, known to operate uh, with small amounts of sample and channels that can vary from micrometers to submicrometers. Also, microfluidic devices have low size, low weight, but a high throughput, and that's why I called a lot of attention from the synch synchrotron community to perform in situ or in vivo experiments in the beam lines. As an example, uh, microfluid having a microfluidic devices having also applied to understand and study pore medias. Here is a pore uh, surface that uh, tend to mimic a subsurface of a rock. However, uh, these micro models have an inherent problem. Uh, the engineer materials used to print this model, like silicon, glass, or PDMS, they do not uh, fully represent the chemical reactivity of the rocks during an experiment. So, for example, in my case, I want to see the reaction of 
a solution and how it would make uh, a mineralization process available. I cannot use it on a micro model, for example, with engineer material. So uh, what uh, people, what the scientists have made is using a real rock as the sample, not an engineer material. And that's what I'm going to show in the next. That's uh, a rock on a ship or macrofluidic device that we develop specifically for use in the carnal webbing line, using the non spot of the carnal webbing line. Here's uh, just uh, the project. Uh, so we are going to draw a channel in the in one of the surface of the, the rock. Uh, this channel has one millimeter wide and 0 0.5 millimeters deep. At the end of this channel, we have two holes with uh, one millimeter of diameter that we work as the inlet and outlet of the channel. Here in the right, in the pictures. So we show our sample, our real rock, with five millimeters of thickness. In one of the flat surfaces, we have the channel draw with the two holes. And from the back view, we can see the inlet and outlet of the fluid. So the idea or the goal here is to use a peristaltic pump so we can, can inject inject the selected solution to the spark and we have a control controlled environment to analyze the mineralization and the results of the interaction the interaction between the solution and the rock so these are primordial conditions to use a beam line to perform experiment in a single beam line you need to have a controlled environment uh, so we can compare uh, measurements before and after uh, experiment. Uh, complementary to the measurements we're going to do in Carnauba, we are we are also going to use the Magna beam line. That's the one that Daphne showed showed the, the results on their of their work of her work. So in the Magna beam, Magna beam line is uh, specifically dictated to tomography, microtomography images, and it has very specific characteristics, mainly because it's cone beam geometry that I show here in the picture. In the picture. So with this cone beam, uh, we can perform analysis in the same experiment with different field of views, uh, looking to different parts of the sample, just by changing the position of the sample along the beam. So we can go from fields of view or areas of interest of millimeters to micrometers uh, very fast. Also, uh, with a full capacity of series, we can perform tomography images in seconds. And as Daphne also mentioned, uh, we can follow in time determined reactions, uh, having many tomographies for each 10 seconds, for example, and to see the evolution of a reaction that for us, specifically the mineralization process, uh, where we want to see the microstructures change induced by the carbon dioxide would be very uh, interesting. And finally, we, in the Mogna beam line, we can uh, make measurements with different uh, energies at the same time. So as Daphne also mentioned, and I'm taking many parts of her presentation, so the image, the results depend on the, the coefficient, the absorption of the material. So if you have materials with different coefficients and interact with different uh, energies, we, we are going to have different uh, contrasts and we'll it helps a lot to different, differentiate phases inside uh, a sample. However, uh, due to its characteristics, we can not use the same device that we use in the mod, in the carnal beam line. So in the mod, we are going to use this flow cell. This flow cell was developed here by the Mognos team. Uh, and it, it uses uh, nylon filter and beads to hold unconsolidated samples inside this p tube. So this tube is transparent to X-ray, so it allows us to perform experiments to fully rotate uh, the device to make the tomography uh, experiment. Also, we can inject fluid to, through this flow cell. So we can uh, follow in time, as I said, uh, a specific reaction. And what we are planning here to make an experiment as close as possible from the one that we are performing at 
the kernel webbing line, uh, we are we will substitute these non-consolidated samples for a cylinder tube. The cylinder uh, will be inside this tube, and we will draw a channel along this cylinder. So when we inject the fluid, it will preferentially pass through the the channel instead of the pores. So again, we are going to have a controlled environment, which for us that are the beginning of the project, it would be very important just in understanding the surf, how the surface reactions happens here. So, all right, going to my final comments. Uh, it is the, purp the main purpose of this webinar. I'm also going to talk about the challenges, aka what went wrong. And the first challenge started at the very beginning with to, that was to obtain a clear cut of the samples. So we got the sample as removed, as collected from the, the, the field uh, with no defined shape. And we first needed to get slices with the five millimeters of thickness. And it was already quite challenging because we done one involved process with uh, chemical lubricants or resins or glues to fix it because we are going to make chemical analysis. So, and chemical lubricant would be contaminate our sample. So it wouldn't be, we wouldn't be able to see the reactions that we want. Also, we want to avoid the polishing process on the surface for the same reason of contamination. So the cutting needed to be as precise as possible to obtain a flat surface. So the Captain tape would make uh, its work on sealing this channel and make the avoiding the leaks of the fluid and keeping the fluid only inside the channel, which by the way was our second uh, challenge to draw the channel with a relative very small channel, one millimeter wide, 0.5 millimeter deep uh, in the rock. As you can see, it was not our sunshine and roses. We broke many samples before we uh, get the ideal conditions to, to obtain this microfluidic device. I think I mentioned it while the presentation. So this is just the beginning of this project. Uh, these slides are the results of our two or three months from now on. From, from since the beginning, uh, we didn't have the opportunity to use the, the to use the device in the beam lines yet. Hopefully, on next month we have a time on the beam line to perform the first experiments and validate it. And here it is, a uh, little move. As just so show the. the rock, the channel of the rock. And here is the peristatic pump you are using. The channel is upside down there. And we use a, fl a flow of 0 0.5 milliliters per minute. So this low flow is to allow uh, the solution interact uh, with the surface in the channel for as many times as possible uh, without the solution uh, go too deep in the pores, which now is not our interest in understanding how the solution reacts inside the pores, but just in the surface. And we let it, we saw it, the captain tape did his its work in the ceiling. No, we didn't have leaks. And like now the next steps, uh, besides to uh, validate the microfluidic in the beam lines, is to improve the device by considering temperatures to control the temperature in the reaction as well pressure and try to reproduce uh, the conditions as close as possible what we have in the nature well i think that's it uh, like Daphne mentioned the, uh, you all can apply for use the synchrotron facets you just have to access the site uh, you have all, all the following rules there and of course, if you need anything, you have take, uh, so you have a question about the beam lines and the requirements to use is you can contact us as well. Well, thank you. And if you have any questions, please answer. 
Thank you, Alizio, for this uh, nice introduction to this to the development that you are making. And it certainly uh, would be interesting to see some results out of the interaction of fluid with the rock properties and rock surfaces. Uh, I have a question of my own, maybe it's a naive question, but uh, what, is, what are the time scales and length scales that you are expecting to see uh, reactions or interactions of fluid with the surfaces in the synchrotron facilities? Yeah, well, as I said, uh, we have a capacity in, both in the Carnauba and Mogg beam lines to see uh, nano alterations. Uh, so as we are planning uh, short experiments, like seven days for mineralization are really short experiments. Uh, so we are expecting to see that like nano uh, changes, like nano uh, mineralization, nano precipitations, or changes in the nano structure of the pores, not much as that. Yeah. But do you have any idea about the time scale of these reactions? No. Uh, uh, I mentioned that uh, we are like in the very beginning of these experiments. Uh, I didn't show here, but we start with the bench uh, experiments, the bench test before to go to the this beam line. And we perform experiments with two weeks and we couldn't yet see uh, the results that we are expecting. So we are not thinking on increased time, but we are thinking on the contrary, to decrease the time, but change the conditions to accelerate this process. Uh, because uh, like we don't have one month available at the beam line, so we need to accelerate this process to make this experiment like one week the most. Yeah. Excellent. Um, and the second question is just uh, more of a broad question. Maybe both of you can answer, but we are starting with you. If anybody wants to collaborate on this research, either uh, with you or with the serious um, synchrotron facility, what, what are the possibilities for the researchers uh, based in Brazil or, or worldwide or around the world? Yeah, I think the short path uh, would be to contact uh, a researcher here in the series or the coordinators of the beam lines uh, show the interest and there are some possibilities like you can be uh, associate research as I am here because I'm a student from a university in Sao Paulo but I'm here as a research collaborator so if you are uh, in other university or other place you can act as a research collaborator spend some time aqui some time here or you can also have this uh, beam line proposals where you can submit your proposal and the committee will evaluate uh, and like you can spend some weeks here doing your experiments not only uh, at the synchrotron laboratory at the beam lines but you can also use all the infrastructure the support laboratory that we have here uh, but i think the short path is direct contact the researchers and show interests and can informations and make this uh, way as a collaborator. Excellent. Thanks a lot. Uh, any questions from this uh, studio? Uh, I've got one. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I've got a question about uh, your micro model. How did you manage to get the channel? Like, what, what method did you use? Is it like chemical reaction or did you carve into the rock to, to make your microfluidics? And my second question would be with the method that you use, whether you will be able to make an actual porous media, because currently you have just single channel. Uh, would you have the opportunity and flexibility to make some pores and throws and make a more complex porous media? Yeah. So the first question, uh, I didn't give much details during the presentation because it's something that we are working yet. So we got some results that we could do, uh, but like it works for one sample and does not work for the other. But basically we used a drill, it was a mechanical process uh, using just water to refrigerate uh, the, the rock. And we could do in some samples and other examples that are more with bigger porosity or rocks a little bit more harder. Uh, it didn't work and we need to figure how we are going to do it yet. 
And about the second question, uh, yes, we are thinking on on suit more complex structure. Uh, one path would be not use not draw the channel, but use uh, the on uh, parts of the the rock to make the fluid pass through. Uh, however, as we are yet interested in the mechanisms and to see if the rock is uh, has its the the capacity to absorb to start uh, the CO2 is, the CO2 and as my uh, project also involves other students uh, students that are working on computational simulations so as I mentioned as controlled as possible the experiment to be now it's better for us so that's why we decided to start just with the channel uh, with a controlled uh, path to the uh, the fluid that we are sure that the fluids there is interacting. Uh, so for now, it's is for us to understand. But for sure, in the future, we are thinking in uh, understand the pore properties. How would be the micropore structures, micropore changes induced by the mineralization? Excellent. Any more questions? Other questions? I have. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I've got a question about like the boundary condition in your system, because you're using uh, at some uh, one side you have glass or some some way to uh, kind of seal your porous media, but the other way like it's it's a rock and all other parts of the rock are exposed to basically uh, atmosphere. So if you're based on your title, you're gonna use uh, carbon dioxide, right? And then so. Basically, at some point, carbon dioxide can infiltrate through the rock. And so basically, the boundary condition that you're applying might not be exactly what you expect. So comment on that. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so the point is that we are not uh, using the supercritical carbon dioxide. We are using it uh, the solute in water. So it's the liquid carbon dioxide. And the test, the flow test that we performed, I, I, I showed the the book in the presentation. Uh, so we saw with that that on that flux of 0 0.5 millimeters per minute during the entire day, and we couldn't see any leaks. Uh, it was sealed with a captain tape, the channel, and we didn't see the leaks, neither on the the tape on the channel or through the pores. So for now, the test that we're doing now with the, the, the liquid carbon dioxide, uh, it is working very well when we are controlling the carbon, the liquid carbon dioxide inside the channel. Okay, thank you. Frank, you had a question? Yeah, just a quick follow-up question uh, regarding the experimental method. So how did you, can you explain a little bit about how you sealed the rock to uh, the another material? Uh, I think I came, came back my presentation, right? Yeah. yeah. You can see it, right? So uh, here, where the channel is drawn, like in this surface, we have just a capton tape. Mm. It's, a cap, it's a tape that is transparent to X-ray and is extensively, extensively used here in the experiments in the secret room in life because X-ray does not see it, so it's transparent. So uh, it would interfere the uh, our experiment. And it's it's just uh, glued here uh, I see. inside the, the channel. Mm. Thank you. Excellent. Then I guess now it's time to wrap up this session and we can Again, thank both of our speakers, uh, Alessio and Daphne, for their wonderful talks and for the introduction to, uh, to, this, wonder, to this excellent synchrotron facility. Um, our next session would be on July 11th. Uh, we, we will have two uh, estates-based uh, researchers. Uh, Zoe Canavas from the Morales Lab from the uh, University of California, Davis. She will talk about flow phenomena under porous scale especial heterogeneity in geological media. And our second speaker will be Hong Fang Kao from the Kong Lab in the University of Minnesota. Uh, and she will give a talk about density effects on the em emergence of unstable focus flow in fractured systems. Uh, with that, I would like to close 
this session and thank you all for joining us and i hope that you will enjoy your summer vacations this is our team and if you want to suggest any speaker or you have any comment for us please contact us as at forest media ttt at gmail.com um, thank you and have a nice evening or morning and ciao